Good afternoon and, and welcome to the penultimate event of the 2022 Neustadt LitFest, a conversation with Senegalese filmmaker Maki Madibasila and Madame Guy. My name is Daniel Simon, and as the editor-in-chief of World Literature Today, I'm delighted and honored to welcome you here today, both here in person and online. Please remember to check out the book table out front as well as, our, as well as our festival reading list on Bookshop, if you haven't already. As you may have seen, Maki and his cameraman, Bole Tiao, have been at the University of Oklahoma this week to work on a documentary film, Murambi at Heart, about our esteemed guest, Bubakar Boris Diop, who is with us again today. Happy birthday, by the way, Boris. <laughs> And that film is being produced by Dakar-based Linkering Productions, of which Maki is the principal. And perhaps he'll talk a little bit about that project as well as in addition to his, his film, uh, El Maestro Lava Sose, which is the subject of their conversation today. Before we begin, I'd like to extend a special thanks to Dr. Man Fung Yip and, and the Department of Film and Media Studies for their generous co-sponsorship of this event and to the College of International Studies, our other major campus co-sponsor this week. I will introduce our speakers, and then time permitting, I will be glad to help moderate a Q&A uh, with the audience after their questions, after their conversation. So to introduce our guest, uh, Dr. Madame Gay is Associate Professor of African and African Diaspora Literatures at East Carolina University. Her work is on verbal art, gender, language, and immigration. Dr. Guy is also a scholar activist of women's rights in Senegal and its American diaspora. Among other publications, she is a contributor to women's songs from West Africa. Makima Dibasila is a Senegalese filmmaker and also a singer known as Daddy Maki, his pen name, his stage name. He studied cinema at the Birmingham F Film School in the UK. El Maestro Labasose is his first documentary film he also, he also directed another film, Il Chante Rouge, about the Senegalese communist militant emblematic figure and politician, Amat Dansoko. He is currently working on his new documentary film, Morambi at Heart, which explores the life and work of renowned author, Bubakar Boris Chio. So shall we start with a clip? And then, if, uh, Pat, if you could play the first clip, the opening sequence of El Maestro Labasose, then we'll have our panelists talk about it immediately after that. Thank you. And please welcome Maram Gai and Maki Madivasila. <laughs> Convergence, la radio panafricaine vous présente Rhythmotech. Amis auditeurs, nous allons aujourd'hui faire rendre hommage à un grand disparu. Vous le savez, aujourd'hui, jour pour jour, il y a dix ans que disparaissait El Maestro Labasosa. À l'époque, j'avais écrit le 2 octobre 2007 ce qui suit. La nouvelle, vous la connaissez, est le maestro de siempre, n'est plus. La Sénégambie et l'Afrique viennent de perdre l'une des plus belles voix et l'un des meilleurs chanteurs et interprètes de la musique afro-cubaine, pour ne pas dire le meilleur. I forgot how a microphone works. And I used to be a singer. That's a shame. Thanks, Professor. Well, where's Daniel? Daniel is gone. Uh, oh, oh, okay. So, okay. Um, thanks for, for having us. My name is Maki Madiba Asila. I am a Senegalese um, filmmaker. And this is my first film documentary called El Maestro Labasose, which chronicles the life 
uh, of one of the greatest um, Senegalese, or let's say Senegambian artist. Um, he was very famous in the in the in the in the sixties, seventies, eighties, and then yeah, for some several reasons, he just disappeared after after the nineties. And yeah, obviously, what I wanted to to do with this film is, let's say, to um, to go back where everything started, like went back to 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 the Gambia, um, do some interviews with his with the members of, of his families. And then um, I just realized that the, how less I knew about him. But his, uh, his music was, has always been very popular. He has always been a, a wonderful and great artist. Everybody in Senegal mostly can sing at least one of his songs, but we didn't know much about him. So I was very curious, um, first of all, why, why he disappeared, and second of all, um, why we didn't know much about him. I was like trying to find footage. Yeah, articles I found very few. And I was very curious how such a great man um, has just disappeared, let's say, out of space. And yeah, that was my, my first motivation as, an, as, as a filmmaker. Um, it took me like five years to, <laughs> yeah, to bring all the material together to, to to, to do the film, and the, the most interesting part was when I wanted to, to, to do that documentary film, um, you know, there's a, there's a process where you write your story, um, where you write a synopsis, and then you, you send it to like, uh, yeah, La Francophonie, <laughs> to try to get the money and make it done. Um, I was very surprised to see that when I, when I send the, the, like the, the scenario and some footage of the film, Mm. I was judged by, uh, by, by a French guy who is like, um, at the time he was like um, 20, 27, 28, and he told me that um, nobody was interested in, such, in uh, such kind of story. And I was so furious, I was, I was angry. My first question was, how come I want to tell the, the story of someone who belonged to me? belong to us, belong to our, uh, our, our people, someone who used to sing for us, uh, someone who has done so many great things. But to finance a film, I have to go to, to France and they decide whether or not I should tell this story, whether or not it is worthy to tell this story. That's when I um, started like Lincoln production. I said, okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna concentrate on my work what I will do is I will, I will start the film without, without funding. So I took my camera and I start shooting, you know, interviews and yeah, that's how the story started. Hi. Can you hear me? I came to this project um, actually in a very serendipitous way because I met Maki on Facebook. <laughs> And at that time, he was really um, working to get the film out, and everybody knew that he was working on the film. And as somebody who grew up in Senegal, I was born in the 70s too, and um, we have this history of Afro-Cuban music in Senegal that is so popular and so ingrained in our history, in our musical history, that um, we took somebody like Rap Labasose for granted. And, but when he disappeared for some reason, nobody literally noticed that he had disappeared because in the 1980s, when I think he was in Cote d'Ivoire at that time, um, another musical giant came in in the name of Mbalakh, which is Senegalese pop music that is spearheaded. Actually, it is inherited from the Afro-Cuban because La Basose, Ibra Kase, all these other producers of Afro-Cuban are the ones that actually um, started Malach, so to say. And uh, our dear Yusundur, who is very well known around the world, actually is from that same school. Um, so for me, I 
this film was like a nostalgic film because I grew up in Senegal dancing to La Basose, but yet not noticing that he had disappeared until he reappeared in the news in this very um, undignified ways because he was sick and ended up really dying alone and destitute. So that's how I came to, to the film and I thought that what Maki was doing is very similar to what uh, writers like Bubakar Boris Job are doing in this whole sense of duty of memory in terms of remembering the people that actually put our country on the national uh, scene. Somebody like Laba Sosie who won um, the gold uh, record, for example, and nobody knew about that. So I also was very touched by this idea that art does not feed its maker so to say, because this is somebody who was very famous, has done so much, but at the same time, he couldn't even pay his hospital bills uh, in the end. Yeah, um, exactly, after, yeah. after reading this, this article uh, written by a cousin of mine, that Labasaze was, was dying because he could not afford like, paying his medical bills, and I was, I was in shock. I was like, how come uh, a man was like, how come this, this giant um, just had a, like a, such a, well, yeah, let's say a pity ending, you know? And my main concern was how come we knew so, so less and so little about him, but as a Senegalese, you know, I didn't know much about the 60s, 70s. Um, there were not many, many footages. Yeah, sometimes you can see, you know, like pictures. You know, but in, film, in terms of film, I knew more, like living in the West, I knew more about the 60s in France, what they call La Période de Ye Ye, with Johnny Hallyday, with uh, Veronique Sanson, and um, whatsoever. Uh, yes, this French rock generation in the 60s, uh, 70s, um, I knew more about Bob Dylan <laughs> here in the US. I even know more about Billy Holiday. I even know more about, yeah, let's say uh, Wilson Pickett, Otis Redding. But I had so less information about my own country. And I felt very, very worried and very sad. And yeah, I, I asked my, my father questions, you know. But um, in Africa, people are very, Prude. Yeah, people are very proud. They don't want to. Like, I couldn't come and ask my father. It's a good, very good friend, actually, of my father who said, Oh, I heard that you're doing a film about Labo. So I said, I said, Yeah. And he told me, But do you know your father was the best salsa dancer, Afro Cuban music dancer? <laughs> you know? But to, to, ask, to go and ask that question to my father, because we have different, like, different cultures, you know, it's like, it was very hard for me. So I brought. Um, uh, several clips of the film, and I asked my dad. I say, "Yeah, um, yeah, you, I just met your, you know, Uncle Bass, and he told me that you were uh, like a, yeah, you were a great dancer. You used to, to to dance on Labasos's music and all." He was like, "Oh, yeah, did you really say that?" I said, "Yeah." And then from the film, we start to have a conversation with my dad, which I've never had before, like his youth, you know, like he used to go to the club. He used to, to dance. I know that he has a, he had a youth too, but it's something that we've, we have never discussed. And that's how I knew he, he, he's a contemporary of Labasos, of course, and he used to go and watch him sing and all of these things. And actually, the greatest, I think, victory about the film is that it, uh, it helped like, break the, the, that wall like people of my generation are having discussions with their, with their fathers or mother and, this, and they're like, oh yeah, this film, this film is for us. He made this for us because we grew up with La Basasi. We used to see him sing. He was very popular. Um, because in, in Africa, you cannot ask your father or your mother whether when he was young, he was going to the clubs. You know, you might get a slap or something like that because it's <laughs> like, they say, hey, what the hell are you talking? So. Um, coming back on La Basose, I wanted him to exist on the, on the space. I wanted people to, to remember him. I was 
I didn't want him to disappear. <clears throat> to disappear. I wanted him like um, the people to say, okay, this is the guy who was born in the in the Gambia in 1943, then who came then at 16, 17 years old in Senegal, and who had this wonderful and great career. Labasosa was touring in the US in the 80s at a particular time where it was very, very hard for, for African artists or musicians to even exist. But the man was so talented that, uh, talented that he signed a contract with Roberto Torres. Roberto Torres at the time was one of the greatest um, Afro-Cuban music producer. And he used to sing with um, um, another Cuban singer that they call El Mejor, which means in Spanish like the best. And all those things, I wanted my, my generation, of course, to know about it. I wanted to share this story about, uh, uh, um, with my generation. But mostly, I wanted people to understand that it is great time for us as filmmakers, let's say writers or um, professors of university, to, um, to tell our own stories in the African perspective. Because every time there is documentaries, it's easy for people from of the West that uh, come and tell whatever they want to tell about us and then bring it back to the West. You know? For me, what I wanted to do is to tell the story of Laba Sose, um, you know, and bring it back to, to my people and say, okay, guys, we were not there at the 60s, we were not even born, but look, this is what happens. This is what, what it was like being growing, growing up in Senegal in the, just after the, the independence in the 60s and 70s. Daniel, I think we can show on uh, another clip, please. Alors, chaque patron, euh, euh, je vous nomme Dexter et Ibrahim Kassé, avait des espions. Qu'allez voir ce qui se passait chez l'autre, est-ce qu'il y a du monde Les, les, les gens s'habillaient avec euh, des cannes, des, des chapeaux. Et, comme, tu te croyais même à la Havane Tu vois, à Plateau, tu te croyais à la Havane Ils étaient élégants, les hommes comme les femmes. Les soirées étaient archi bondées, pleines à craque. Il y a des moments où à une certaine heure, si tu viens, tu n'as pas où t'asseoir. Tous les gens que, que, que vous voyez au Sénégal, ils sont des chefs de société ou bien des ministres ou bien des... Je sais, même, même, même des, des gens qui n'ont rien, ils ont aimé la basse aussi. Ils ont, ils ont dansé sur ces chansons. Parce qu'il y avait une époque où le Miami, il y avait deux pistes. Il y avait la première piste qui était dehors, balle poussière. C'est la deuxième piste, la première piste, c'était dedans. Si tu payes, tu rentres. Si tu n'as pas de quoi payer, tu es là-bas, dehors, pour, la, pour le balle poussière. On ne pouvait pas, c'est pas quelqu'un qu'on pouvait, qu pouvait canaliser, non, non, non. Fais ceci ou fais cela, il, il avait horreur de ça. Chante comme ça, chante, non, non, non. C'était un type qui avait la bougeotte, versatile. Il ne restait pas sur place. Là-bas, on n'est jamais resté longtemps dans un groupe, que ce soit au Miami, le Starban, le Superstar. Pendant quelques temps, ça n'allait plus entre lui et Dexter. Et en 68, il quitte Dexter pour aller à Abidjan. It was, um, from where we started, it was important for me again to, to go to, to, the, to the Gambia, where he was born, and then to follow him to, to, the, to the Ivory Coast where he become this huge superstar. And the funny thing is, um, when I started the film, I, wanted to, to, uh, I went to Cuba, to La Havana, because for me it was important, uh, as we are talking about Afro-Cuban music, um, to, to go to Cuba, because for me this is the, this is the, the roots of Afro-Cuban music. And uh, I went to Cuba in 2017, And yeah, when I arrived at La Havana, I was very excited. I was like, and I start talking to the musicians. 
and they were like, say, well, why are you here for? I'm th- uh, I told them, yeah, I'm doing a documentary film about Labo. So he said, oh, yeah, we know him. Yeah, he's, yeah, yeah, he was great. You know, God rest his soul. He was amazing. And, I, and I'm like, okay, um, I want to know about Afro-Cuban music. And I want to know about um, the roots of Afro-Cuban music. Uh, would you guys would like to, to tell me something, where this music started? And they were like, really? You serious? I said, okay, what's the music called? I said, Afro-Cuban. They say, what do we mean by Afro? I said, uh, Africa? So they tell me, okay, then that's me. that means you don't have nothing to do here. <laughs> no, everything started in Africa. This music was born in Africa, and it came here for slavery. So the, the roots of this music is at home. If you want to tell the story of Laba Sose, tell it from the African perspective. Because everything that we are doing is the heritage, is the legacy from our ancestors. We were brought, brought here because of slavery, but um, we have survived, and the music, the art, has already survived. And this is, why, this is how I understood that, um, yeah, this was a very beautiful story to, to share with my people. So, um, Labasose used to say that by singing Afro-Cuban music, he is taking back what was taken from Africa and that the music is recycled. Like this, the music literally did also a triangular trip leaving Africa, going to the Americas, and coming back to Africa. And because most of the time people were questioning why were Africans playing Afro-Cuban music or claiming, reclaiming Afro-Cuban music. And he used to say that. What are the other parallels that you see between um, the music that you saw in Cuba that people are listening to when you went there in 2017? and what is happening on the African continent in terms of music in 2017? Um, I think what, um, I was very surprised to see that uh, most of the African Cuban music singers, they, they, they sing in, in, in Spanish. And I was very surprised to see that the Cuban musician, they were singing Saini, one of the greatest hits of La Basse, in Wolof, in Cuba. Then they were singing um, this, this particular, this famous song of, um, I think it's Medun Jalo, I don't know, maybe Boris can correct us if we were wrong. Yai, sama yai boy. Yai, sama bai boy. Ama bai boy. Ama yai boy. Maraka bai boy. Bai boy. Maraka yai boy. Yai boy. Ayah, yai, yai, yai boy. Yeah. Yay. Yeah, yeah, bad bad man. Man. So that song is Mommy, Mommy Forgive Me. Yeah. I don't think it was Laba Sose. No, it was Laba Sose. Boris, can you help us with that? <laughs> huh? We have to figure it out. You thought it was Laba Sose? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> still, I was very surprised and moved. To see that the, uh, actually Wolof. So did they know the meaning of the of the lyrics? Or they were just singing because I it's don't a think so. song. I think they were just singing the songs, and it was it was huge. Can, 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 I mean, you can understand. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a Senegalese, you know. Growing up, I arrive in, in in Cuba. I go into a party. I'm I'm here to to listen to Afro Cuban music, and then they start singing in my language. I'm like ten thousand kilometers from my home. I was like, oh, okay. This is, yeah. This is, this is interesting. And yeah, just to, to answer your, your, your question, uh, because Laba has toured a long time with Afro-Cuban uh, musician in New York, mm. and because he was signed in a record label, um, um, yeah, the, the producer. Yeah, Mongito was the thing, but Roberto Torres was Roberto. the producer. And that's how uh, um, I think they get familiar to his songs. And it's funny, it's not only Cuba. When we started the, the Facebook page, mm-hmm. we were receiving messages from Panama, mm-hmm. from Colombia, from Mexico, from Ecuador, from Peru. 
And I was like, this is, this is not possible. I was answering to these people. I said, hey, uh, are you kidding me? Do you really know Lobos? And they say, what? We grew up with this music. We've been listening to this guy ever since. My parents, you know? And I went to, like, to Colombia one month. I was in Colombia to, to screen the film. And there is one of the biggest hits of Laba Sose. Um, in the film, um, when, when, the, when the song started hitting, I've, seen, I've, I've heard the whole crowd, the whole audience, uh, singing the song. Which song was that? Um, okay, I have to remember. It's um, Jamulema. Oh, okay. Jamulema. Jamulema. Is that in Lingala? Or? Is it in Lingala? It's in Lingala. Okay. And I've discovered that one of the greatest singers in Colombia uh, has stolen the song. <laughs> so, so one of the, 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 the biggest attributes of Laba Sose was to be able to take African languages exactly. and sing Afro-Cuban music yes. using African languages. So he sang in Wolof, he also sang in Swahili, and he also sang in Lingala. And then also in, um, what is the other language? Gere, in Gere, because one of his wives was from Ivory Coast and was of Gere descent. So he sang in all these African languages and was able really to include or vest African languages into this Afro-Cuban music and creating these parallels between the African diaspora and, and, and Africa, which actually made it so wonderful because growing up in Senegal and, and, and dancing African Cuban music, you, you, you kind of know Spanish words, but with La Basose, you are able to actually really know what he's singing about because he is speaking in Wolof or in languages that you know. And he was born in the Gambia, but literally grew up in Senegal because he came to Senegal in when he was in 18 years old or 20 years old. So Senegal claims him as their son, but literally he was born in Butterst, which used to be Banjul, the now capital of the Gambia. So in the earlier panel, when people were talking about Senegal and the Gambia being the same, literally, that's exactly what it is. We are the same people, um, but colonization, of course, divides the two people into two nation states, which is very interesting in that way. So um, it's very fitting that La Bosse is seen as this Afro-diasporan who can be claimed by people from Panama, people from Peru, people from Ivory Coast, people from Senegal, because again, like he was saying, he is reclaiming the music that the enslaved Africans brought to the Americas and then took it back and then made it into also another local musical genre that so many of us grew up dancing. And I, I actually wanted to, to, to disagree with Maki a little bit when he was talking about in, in, in Africa, when you don't talk to parents about their young age, some, some, but for example, personally in my family, my mother is the one who taught us how to dance Afro-Cuban music. So she was the one who told us the difference between salsa, uh, pachanga, merengue, bachacha, all of those, my mom is the one, my mom is a contemporary of La Bosse. So she was born in 1941, and she never went to school, but in her generation, Afro-Cuban music was really the genre that they connected with the African diaspora, and she was able to tell us every step, how you dance this, how do you dance it in family parties. So this film, to me, is, is a very personal film too, because as I was reading and, and, and watching it, I could remember the dance parties with my mom leading and telling us, no, you don't dance salsa this way, you dance it that way. This is where you do the two step, this is what do you call the pachanga, it's very different from the merengue. So it's really interesting to, to see how families actually connected with Laba's music simply because he was also able to speak the African languages that they uh, spoke at home. You have a great mom. She's very open-minded. <laughs> I tell you, my mom would not never tell me something like that. Anyway, um, yeah. Um, um, Daniel, can we show another clip and then maybe we start with the questions? La Bassocé est décédée le jeudi 20 septembre 2007 à 3 heures du matin dans une clinique de Dakar où il était admis 
quelques jours auparavant, laissant ainsi tous les musiciens et mélomanes orphelins. Il avait 64 ans. Transporté à la morgue de l'hôpital principal de Dakar, il a été inhumé au cimetière musulman de Yoff en présence d'une foule nombreuse d'artistes, musiciens, de parents. Um, I was telling him that in some of the clips, none of the clips we see Labba yeah, in real life. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we're going to play a, a clip that has him maybe later yeah, so yeah. that people could see him <laughs> singing. Um, I wanted to ask, um, how do you connect the work that you've done here with Labba Sose and the work you intend to do uh, in the documentary dedicated to our distinguished uh, birthday guy over there, Bubakar Boris Jo. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I'm, I'm very intimidated to talk about Boris when Boris is, is, is here, so <laughs> I'm gonna try. <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, why, why Boris Job, and why, why, why not somebody else? If that can help you start, since you're intimidated. That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the way that Boris came to me, um, I've read long ago Murambi, but I'm ashamed to say that this, this is the only book of Boris that I knew. Really? Um, yeah. Uh, but for some reason, I've been following him, following him, like all his articles, you know, every time that um, he takes like positions um, through his article, I was, I, um, I found it very, very interesting. Um, and Florian, Bobin. Florian Bobin, who is a historian, um, said to me once, yeah, uh, um, because we, we are doing another film called, um, Revolutionary Senegal in the name of freedom, which chronicles yeah the independent sixties, you know, the the left, you know, like like the the so called communists, the militants for you know, mm. whether it's uh, during this era, um Le Parti African, the L'Independence, um that's how I, it came up that Boris mm. was a was a militant, you know. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> and he grew up with 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 this, yeah. Um yeah, in this in the particular period of time where it's got like the Cold War and where everybody has to choose a, a side. And, and we went to see him and we did this wonderful interview. And it came up like, for me, it was just like, mm, like an evidence. I said, uh, okay, man, this man has so much things to say, you know. Why people don't know more about Bubakar Boris job? Again, why there was not, um, because in this, Boris is very, you know, he's like, let's say, he's, he's not hiding, but he's not, he's, he's, he's very, You mean yeah. he's antisocial? No, not antisocial, but he's a, he's a character, Boris. But he's an intellectual, he's a writer, and writers don't like, um, yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, you know, you have this, so, this so question. So he's, he's always in his creation, okay. so to say. So, okay, so my role as a filmmaker, um, because people are scared of intellectuals, because yeah, they, 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 they have big brains, they, 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 have, they know a lot. They, they, in my case, that's a, I was like, I was, I was literally shaking just to come and ask questions because you, you, you feel like, okay, these people, they have PhDs, they have this and they have that. And you think like we live in such separate worlds, separate worlds. Mm. And, and I think that the big mistake for us as Africans that we are making, how we have, the, on a compartment, how we have separated like the writers to the filmmakers, the filmmakers to the, to the artists, to the, to the artists to the, to the painters. And for me, we all have the same, let's say, um, uh, goal. Like we are, we are trying to, to, to say things that we can share with our, first with our own, own people, this is normal because <laughs> yeah, we are Senegalese, but to share that with the rest of the world. Again, I want the people to know who Bubaka Boris Job is. The, the, the person is not, is, is not very, very easy because, you know, 
Yeah, but the writer and, and the intellectual, you know, and the, the great job that, that, that he's doing for, for us, for our people. And that sometimes I feel that we are, like there's a bridge between, between us, you know, or that, let's say a wall. A gap. You know, and, I, and I, doing a film about Boris is, yeah, I want to see Boris on the screen. I... Uh, let's say, to, to answer very easily. Uh -huh. I wanted like my people, like where you are sitting, I wanted to go to different part of my country, Senegal, and I said, okay guys, watch. Watch this man and listen to this man. So, 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 Bobakar Boris Job, um, I always kind of shudder a little bit when I call him Bobakar Boris Job because traditionally I'm not supposed to, I'm supposed to say Uncle Bobakar Boris Job, and I'm so used to saying Tonton Boris that I feel like I'm always transgressing when I call him Bubakar Boris Job. So I always have this pause, but um, for the sake of this space, we always call him by his name, but uh, he knows I respect him. Uh, so Bubakar Boris Job is a writer, he's a journalist, he's a filmmaker, he's an activist, he's a public intellectual, he's many other things. So what parts of those do you think would be the most challenging part to tell as you prepare for this, this documentary? Um, um, doing my research, I've, what I've discovered is there's not one Boris, there is many sides side of Boris. <laughs> Maybe this should be the title of the movie, Boris, Many Sides of Boris. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, I don't want to do the mistake of making a film about the writer, because it can be it can be very boring. Why would that be a, a mistake? Yeah, it, it, it be like because as a director, you, you don't want like take position. When you start a subject, you say, okay, this is what I want to say, because you never know what's gonna come up on the footage. Okay. You never know what the story is gonna be. You know, when I started this film, I didn't know that he was he will be the winner of the Noisha Prize, let's say. So I'm saying like I'm I'm thinking, okay, maybe this is a new start. So, so I'm going to start the movie here in Neustadt, when he's receiving the prize, when he's doing his acceptance speech. And from there, I will tell his story. How did he start it? You know? And then I want to make, let's say, a film. Oh, this, this is a very hard question. Okay, I want to make a film uh, about a person um, whose life changed because of literature. I don't know if you get to say, quelqu'un qui a, dans sa vie, dans la vie, a basculé grâce à la littérature. Ou bien à cause de la littérature. Yeah, yeah, I, I get that. The, what I'm trying to say is that you're going to do maybe one hour documentary like you've done with uh, La Bosse yeah. how, how do you crush or sit, fit a life <laughs> like the giant? the gigantic life of Bubakar Boris Job into this one hour. So that's what I'm trying to say. Like, what are the challenges that you anticipate in terms of covering Bubakar Boris Job, the writer, the activist, the public intellectual, the journalist, all of that? Yeah. So I have to find what, what the French call the, the, just, the just milieu, okay. <laughs> you know? Because there is many parts of Boris, you know? But of course, if you want to, to tell the story of Boris, you, you're, gonna, uh, you're gonna talk about his books, about his, his, his writing, his experience as like um, writing in Africa today. And yeah, the, I think the most interesting part is when he starts to write in Wolof. That's part of the film too, you know? Because at the beginning he was writing in French and then after the, after the genocide in, 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 in Rwanda, he said, okay, now I'm gonna, Start writing in Wolof because uh, if you say you are you are uh, you are um, um, how did how did you say it? if you say you are a African intellectual or a writer and then something like this just just happened like um, ten thousand people has been have been I mean were killed literally every day more than one million people dead but at the time we in Africa we were watching. Uh, 
Brazil, like the World Cup here in 1994 in the United States, we were even not aware of what was happening. And then this leads him to start writing on, uh, in, in Wolof to make himself uh, understand first by us and then the rest of the world. Because Semben Usman, who is one of the best, uh, yeah, he was one of the, like the father, let's say the godfather of cinema. He said this, this, this sentence that I find very beautiful. He said, um, I'm tired of trying to, I'm not doing films for the West to understand me or to know who I am. You know, I'm doing first cinema <laughs> for my own kind to know who, who I am. I'm more interested in first of the eye of the Senegalese, of the Africans, before what the rest of the world think. And I think it's a very interesting approach. Um, because when I watch, when I saw my film to, to, to my son, he's like, um, he's almost 13 years old. He looked at the film, then he asked questions. He was very interesting, you know. Um, and then he told, me, and he told me, yeah, dad, I just love the film. But I, I thought you was going to do a film like Black Panther. And I, and I said, OK. Again, here comes the narrative. Here comes um, the same thing that I went through as a, as a young African when I, I, I only grew up with Western figures, everything from the West. Before I knew Sam Benjamin's work, I knew more, uh, let's say, John Ford work, like uh, Steven Spielberg work, uh, Star Wars. I know more about American cinema and until today than, than <laughs> Uh, let's say, I, I don't like the term African cinema because I don't know what it is, but this is how, how they define us. Um, yeah, to, to do a film about, on, uh, about Bubaka Boris Job is, um, is very interesting, but very challenging as well. Uh, very challenging as well because less film about writers in Africa. We don't have, we don't have much. Should we open it to the audience? I don't think we have maybe like less than 10 minutes. Do we have any questions from the audience for Maki or for Dr. Guy? Uh, Maram? Maram as well, yes. Maram did the subtitles of the movie in English, you know. Thank you. Questions? I know many of Dr. Yip's students are here. <laughs> They're scared to talk, maybe. Come on, guys. We good. You get extra credit just if you ask a question. So. <laughs> the, the, I promise. They're all like, oh, OK. <laughs> Nobody want to talk? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Can I give you the mic? It's OK. I can do that. No, I can give you the mic. Uh, thank you for being here, firstly. Um, this is really a cool experience. Um, you had mentioned um, earlier in, in the talk that um, someone, a Frenchman, had discouraged you from making this film. What motivated you to keep going anyway and to dig deeper? Oh, great question. Um, I was frustrated, again, living in the West, when I watch TV, I see Johnny Hallyday. When I watch TV, I see Michael Jackson. When I watch TV, I see, I don't know, Artist Redding, Aretha Franklin. I, uh, I see the Beatles. But where are we? My first question was, where are we? Don't we have artists that um, deserve to be put on screens? Don't we have stories to share with the world? Um, yeah, it was a big challenge, but I wanted to, 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 yeah, to do the film when this French guy, when this Francophonie, yeah, again, they told me that this is a story not worth to be told. I was very, I was very, I was very upset, you know, and I told them, okay, I will show you. So this is where I, I started my, my company. It's called Lincoln Production, and I'm specializing in documentaries, you know, because we have so many great figures, like we are doing like, we have like four, actually four documentaries on production, like Bobaka Boris Job. There's another very famous 
Senegalese talent uh, soccer player. His name is Jules Francois Bokande. He's the first African soccer player to be the best scorer, you know, in a championship in Europe. This was in 1986. People forget about him. They act like he has never existed, you know. And yeah, I just wanted this, the world to see our stories. But before the world, us back at home, because when people, they, 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 they see the film of Labasase, what they were telling me is, how come we have never known the story? How come, uh, because I'm not the generation of Labasase. You know, I'm quite, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to be old, but I'm, I'm still young, you know? <laughs> and, and I was like, how come nobody ever tell this, this story? It's the same with like Sheikh Anta Job. Sheikh Anta Job is a, is a, is a, is a, is a giant, a monument. But we have, we, we waited 32 years old after he passed before to make one film. But I'm telling them that this guy deserves a thousand films. So just wanted to share our stories. Great question. Coming around. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm really interested in, um, uh, we've been talking about like reclaiming, right? Um, in, in, in different spaces and uh, like here today. And um, it makes me think of your work with Labo Sose makes me think of like this idea for like the young students might know who Burner Boy is, right? So Burner Boy really has this love for Fela Kuti and, um, and this fa fascination with Fela, and you can hear that in his music, even though it's Afrobeats now, right? But you can hear the influences of Fela's work. So I'm really curious about if that's happening in, in Senegal. Like, you have this new interest, right? You have this interest in Laba Sose, and I'm curious if that's happening artistically in Senegal. Are people finding, refinding Afro-Cuban music, like now, in the music, in the culture now, or is like you're trying to put it back into that space? Like, is that is is anything happening similar? Um, or uh, Imbala? Like, yeah, yeah, Imbala. I think, not, yeah, yeah. Um, literally, like Maron was saying, like Mbala has killed literally, let's say, Afro-Cuban music, and unfor unfortunately, this generation, all this music. After I did the film, there is like six, seven person who passed, you know, before, before the film was finished. And this, this generation, like this, this music is literally, what we call African music in Senegal, is dying, you know. But um, there are still the okay. where the music is recycled into uh, new genres, such as hip hop, for example. You see hip hop art artists sampling, um, Afro-Cuban beats or s some song, because some, some songs like uh, La Bossosse Seni, for example, are very famous, they're classics in Senegal, and people keep singing them over and over again. But at the same time also, if you go to Dakar now, there are some nightclubs where they have Saturdays where there's only Afro-Cuban. So you still have Afro-Cuban musicians that are there, young, not many, but it's still there. You just have to go to the right places to find it. But I wish it could be, there could be more places and I wish that, um, yeah, new generation will, will, yeah, will try to, to keep the legacy of, of La Basose through Afro-Cuban music. Because Senegal is, is known um, as yeah, the center of this music in, in West Africa. Thank you, Marie. Any final burning questions? Yes, Kathy. I'm curious where it's showing, is it showing anywhere in the United States? How do we see it? <laughs> How has it, when will the, the mm -hmm. Boris part mm -hmm. be done? Will we be able to see it? Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask the, the, the emails of, uh, yeah, we're going to find a piece, yeah, piece of paper and 
people are going to write down their emails, obviously. It was actually shown at the New York Film Festival this year. Yeah. Um, to, to actually great acclaim, and it has been shown in many places, uh, so to say. And I think also it's possible, for example, to have viewing, um, if, for example, the university is interested to be able to, to see it, um, for students to see it in other places. And I think Vimeo also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where he can give you access to it, I think. Yeah. yeah. yeah but, but it was viewed at the New York Film Festival and many other film festivals. It was pretty good. Boris's is in the making. I, actually, some of the footages of the Neustadt Prize will be in the documentary. So it's anticipated in 2023. That's when the documentary on Boris is going to be coming out. Yeah. Hopefully, we can have yeah. some sort of premier, U.S. premier here in Norman. Yeah, and, that would be nice. And bring you back for that, for that event. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we need to pause, a pause cafe, as they would say, to have a little uh, cup of tea or coffee or something, okay. snack, before we have the big finale, the prize ceremony for the New Stat International Prize for Literature at four o'clock, so we'll welcome you all back in about half an hour. In the meantime, please thank Dr. Marangai and Maki Marivasila for their great presentation today. Thank you. Thank you.